My name is David Capes. Uh, last time I was here was a couple of years ago. I was the dean of the School of Biblical Theological Studies at Wheaton College. And over the last uh, year, my wife and I have come to live back into Houston, where I am now the senior research fellow at the Linear Theological Library. So it's a great joy for me. We've got lots of great plans. You'll be hearing about them coming up from Mark Lear himself. But uh, it's just an exciting time to be a part of, of what's going on. It's my joy to come and share with you a little bit around Scripture today and to talk a, a little bit about passages worth the dig. That's what Mark is talking about these days. Last time, you guys look, I think, at the book of Joshua. Today we're going to go to the Gospels. I am working on a book for a publisher. It's called Matthew Through Old Testament Eyes. And the idea of the book is if we really knew the Old Testament well, how might we read the book of Matthew better? So I'm going back and forth between the Old Testament and the New, trying to show that there's a connection there, that we don't need to unhitch them, or we don't need to disconnect them in any way, that the Bible of Jesus and the early church was the Old Testament. They didn't have Paul's letters. They didn't have the Gospels. What they had was the, the Torah, the law, the prophets and the writings. And so we, as followers of Jesus, if we really want to imitate Jesus, if we really want our lives to be conformed to his life, we better get a bit more comfortable with the Old Testament. And that's sort of the idea behind the book. So today I want to share with you some of the insights that I think I have gleaned from reading in Matthew chapter 4. And the title, if you need a title, is The Devil Didn't Make Me Do It. Anybody remember this guy? Who is it? Flip Wilson. Born in 1933, he had a, a, a really good quality uh, variety show back in the early, early 70s, I think it was. And he had a variety of characters. My, one of my favorites was this one. Remember Geraldine? Well, what, what, there's a couple of, couple of catchphrases that came out of that show. One of them is, the devil made me do it. Remember that? And the other one was, what you see is what you get. WYSIWYG. That's where they got it, the whole idea. So the devil made me do it. Well, today, the devil didn't make me do it. And I want to look at this passage of Scripture that is associated in Matthew's Gospel with the temptation. It's often called the temptation of Jesus. I think it might be better to call it the test of Jesus. Jesus is being tested here. And so what I want to do is take a look at, at that. Now, um, Matthew chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, turn there, please. I'm going to be trying to look here at the Elmo and give us a, a reading of the text, reading from the English Standard Version. It's a beautiful, beautiful translation of the Bible. Maybe some of you have that. The temptation of Jesus, or better, maybe the test of Jesus. Can we see that? We're going to start reading there. Then Jesus was led up by the... I see that Mark's already been here. He's made notes here. <laughs> then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, Diabolos, Hasatan, the Satan. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I think we'd say in Texas he was mighty hungry. That's sort of in the translation. He was mighty hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, as the voice of his baptism had just said, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, set him up on a pinnacle of the temple, literally the wing of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, the devil now quoting scripture, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord to the test. 
Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, not just a high mountain, but a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, quoting again from the book of Deuteronomy, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, not for long. The devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. I want to take a look and get you to remember for a moment what happened at Jesus' baptism. Jesus is baptized by John. He goes down in the water. He comes up from the water and he has a vision. And in that vision, he sees the heavens open. And in that vision, he hears the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son. In him, I am well pleased. And when he saw the Spirit, he said the Spirit came down like a dove. Now, I've often wondered about that, and I don't have time to really develop that today. But let me suggest to you, as we look at the screen, let me suggest to you that there's a reason for the Spirit to come down like a dove. The double dove was a signal to Jesus. It was an, uh, I don't want to use the term omen, because I don't really understand omens or believe in them, but I think... The symbol of the dove from the Old Testament, if we really knew that symbol, it symbolized that Jesus' destiny would be one of suffering. The dove has a suffering image within the Old Testament. Sometime if Mark invites me back, then we'll make that happen. So Jesus has this glorious vision. He has this wonderful audition, something he heard. And yet, at the same time, he understood my destiny is one of suffering. And so immediately, as it were, the, the Spirit drives Jesus. This is how it says it in, the, uh, in, 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 in Mark's gospel. So the Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness where he is tested. But he's not alone. The agent of testing here is the devil. The place of the testing is the wilderness. And the duration of his time there is 40 days and 40 nights. Passage is worth the dig. I love, this, I love this artwork, by the way. I'm showing you some classic art. The word translated tempted here in some translation it can also be translated trial or test. I think it's better to take it that way than take it simply as the idea of temptation. Because the scripture says the spirit or God does not tempt us to sin and towards sin. Instead, God does test us. And that's exactly what we find in the scripture over and over and over again. In the Old Testament, God testing his people. If you asked someone who was familiar with the Old Testament at the time of Jesus about God's testing, they would describe two particular events, important events. Probably you remember them, probably you know them. One is the event where Abraham is called by God to take his son, his only son, Take him to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him there. What does Abraham do? He does. He obeys. He does exactly what God says to do. He passed the test. And the angel of the Lord speaks to him. Now, as you know, God spared the son at the very last moment. And that's the way God often is. He comes in at 1159 to save the day, to heal a man of cancer, to heal someone of blindness. He comes in at the last moment to save a family that is in jeopardy of just sort of cracking and falling apart. God very often comes in at the last minute, which is what he did. And what the, Spirit, what the Lord said to him then through the angel of the Lord is this. It's a beautiful saying. He said, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time and said, from heaven, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this. You have not withheld your son, your only son. I will indeed bless you. I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as, as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies. And by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves because you have obeyed my voice. 
Abraham, you will be the source of a universal blessing. This is a restatement of God's original promise to Abraham, to bless him, to make his family great, so that his son would be his heir, not someone else, that his children would be numerous, as numerous as the stars of the sky, and that he will be a great nation, and that he will be a universal blessing. Now, all those things came true until Jesus, they were not a universal blessing, but the blessing began to expand and to move and to go into all the nations. So Jesus is the offspring, the singular offspring through which the nations of the world were to be blessed. That's the way the early Christians read it. Go back and read Paul in uh, Galatians chapter three and four and you'll see that. Now here's, here, here's, the, here's the idea that, that Jesus is the son of Abraham. That's how the gospel begins. Jesus, the book of the genealogy of Jesus, the son of Abraham, the son of David. And throughout the book, he tries to make connections. He does make connections between Abraham and Jesus. And here, this time of testing, I'm convinced, is part of that. So he says, here's, here's the second one. If you ask a Jew of the time about testing and God testing his people, he would point to this passage or passages like it, that God tested his people in the wilderness, where Jesus is, by the way, right now. On the plains of Moab, God, uh, Moses says, God has led you 40 years in the wilderness. And this is his purpose, to humble you, because you weren't humble before, and to test you. This is the point of it. And the test is not there so much for God's benefit, but for our benefit and their benefit, so that they would know what they were made of so they never know what kind of people they are. Let me suggest to you that some of the tests that you endure and some of the challenges you endure are really like a spiritual mirror that is held up in front of you. See, what are you made of? What's really inside of you? God is not just tempting, he doesn't tempt us. He's not just testing us for his own benefit to see, well, are you gonna pass the test or not? I'm convinced that as I've read these passages over and again, that the testing is really ultimately for our benefit so that we can know what we're made of, so that we can know what's inside of us. When you're squeezed, what comes out of you? Is it anger? Is it hatred? Is it violence? Is it sorrow? Is it pity? Is it self-pity? When you're squeezed, what comes out of you? That reveals what's in you. You can't have something else. The reason Jesus was never, uh, when he was squeezed, he never became angry is because there was no anger in him. When Jesus got squeezed, guess what came out? Compassion. Compassion for the multitudes. Oh, he was, he was frustrated at times. He was angry at times, but it didn't result in violence of any sort resulted in compassion for the, for, for the masses. So throughout Matthew's gospel, he shows you how Jesus is the son of Abraham over and over again, and you see that. Also in the gospel, it shows you how Jesus is the new Israel. Wish I had time to develop all that because all that's really pretty fun. Look at this uh, passage here all the way on the right. It comes from the book of Deuteronomy, which is gonna be quoted over and over again here. Know then in your heart that as a parent disciplines a child, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Therefore, keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways, by fearing him. Are we walking in his ways? Are we fearing him? Fear doesn't here mean fright. Are we worshiping him? Are we honoring him? Are we bending the knee to him? Duration of testing, 40 days. Duration of the testing, how long was it? 40 days and 40 nights. Have you ever noticed how often that happens in the Bible? 40, 40, 40. Somebody liked the 40 number, right? 40 years Israel spent in the wilderness. 40 days Moses spent on Mount Sinai. 40 nights it rained on the earth. 40 days the spies. 40 days, Nineveh said, or Jonah said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will perish, Jonah said in the book of Jonah. Always 40, 40. I wonder why 40. The generation, perhaps? That's clearly what happens in, in one or two passages. The whole generation has to come and go 
before the next thing happens, right? So here's, here's the way that it kind of works out. The agent of testing is here the devil, Satan. The adversary, some translations say. Diabolos in the Greek. The Diabolos, the Satan. And Satan, by the way, doesn't show up a lot in the Old Testament, if you notice. He's not there much. But he is there in some key passages. Maybe one of the classic passages is this one. It's prosecuting attorney. I wonder how Mark likes that image. Uh, Job chapter 1, verse 9 where he seems to make a deal with God for the life, for the welfare, for the family of Job. Remember that passage? There's maybe a, a better passage for our purposes here where it comes in, in, in this way. Satan appears as an accuser in the book of Zechariah. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, he appears as an accuser of a fellow named Joshua, a guy named Joshua. Now keep that name in mind for just a moment. He showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord, Satan standing at his right hand <clears throat> to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man, Joshua, a brand plucked from the fire. It's an amazing passage. It goes on and it tells us that Joshua the high priest passed the test and he is given the priestly garb, and he's allowed to intercede for the people. He becomes a priest. And what we see is that the name Joshua and the name Jesus are really the same name. He goes on to say, and this is the part I want to show you that's really significant. He and his colleagues, Joshua and his colleagues, whom God has chosen, have become an omen of things to come when God brings my servant the branch. Some of you know that the word Nazarene is built as a play on words of the word branch, the branch of David. So it's a, it's a messianic passage, it's a connection between scriptures past and scriptures present in the time of Jesus. Here's a passage that I think that they reflected on, that they knew, that they were aware of, to say that Jesus is going to take on a priestly role that is beyond any. A friend of mine has written a book called Jesus the Priest. His name is Nick Perrin. He's now president of uh, uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. A great New Testament scholar. It's a good book. It's one that you can find, I'm sure, at the Linear Theological Library. I want to look particularly at the temptations and go right through them very quickly. The first temptation, as you know, the tempter lures him with this thought, if you are the Son of God, as the Scripture has just said, as the voice that you heard just said, if you really are God's Son, and this is my translation, speak so that these stones become bread. Speak in such a way that these stones become bread. You're hungry, right? You're famished, right? You're mighty hungry. Speak, and these stones will become bread. If that's truly who you are. Jesus, however, refused to do so. Now, you remember there's a passage in the Old Testament where the Lord instructs Moses to speak to what? A rock to produce water. I can't help but think that as Jesus is hearing this speak so that these stones become bread, that in his mind he's thinking about Moses. He's thinking about Israel in the wilderness. He's thinking about the rock giving forth water, and it did. Now, that was a test, in a sense, then, and it's a test now. Jesus, of course, does not comply. He doesn't speak so that these stones become bread. Instead, he answers with the book of Deuteronomy. And this is how he answers. It's one of the best-known books, by the, time, by the way, at the time of Jesus. It was quoted most of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Jesus said, it is written, it stands written, and it will be written forever. One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And when we go back and reread that particular text in context, when biblical writers quote the Old Testament, they're just not quoting a verse. They're quoting a verse in context. And if we go back and look at what that passage is all about in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8, this is what it says, or this is how it lays it out, if you will. 
Moses at the moment is reminding the people of something. He's telling them that you're about to go into the land, you're about to possess the land, but don't think for one minute that this is on you. Don't take credit for any victory. Don't think that somehow you got here on your own. Understand that the victory is mine. I am the one going before you, I am the one fighting. The moment you think that it's on you, you'll find yourself losing the battle, and they did. But over and over, God's testing his people to show them from the inside out that obedience and allegiance to God and his teaching is what's going to light the way to the future. That's sort of what the passage is all about. So the result is this, humility. If I understand that my life, every moment of it is God's gift, and that every talent and every, everything that I have is ultimately coming from God, it's hard to be proud, except in God. It's hard to boast here. It's easy to boast there. Boasting in the Lord, as Jeremiah said, it's okay to boast but as long as our boasting is in the Lord. As, as long as we're showing our, pr our pride and our privilege in the Lord God, which is what Israel does time and time again and also fails to do at times, as we all have failed to do at times. Later on, Jesus will give a teaching called the Beatitudes. That first Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's what this is about. Blessed is the person who is poor in spirit, who's, who realizes their bank account spiritually is zero, who understand they've never made a deposit in that account. Blessed are those who, who declare their dependence upon God for everything. That's what Israel was called to do. That's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus and as following him as his example. The... Uh, Second temptation, one that you know, Jesus now is in the holy city, he's in Jerusalem. Now, I don't exactly understand this, uh, I have to admit. If you go back and look, the devil took him to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. I, wait a minute, I thought he was in the wilderness. Now he's somewhere else. What sort of happened here? Well, I, I, I don't really know that I have a good answer for you there. Uh, is it possible Jesus is having a vision? It's possible. Is it possible that he's having sort of an out-of-body experience? I, I, think, I think it's possible. Uh, is it possible that the, the, uh, the Satan sort of led him back to the temple area in Jerusalem. It's about 13 miles away. It's up a very, very tough hill, by the way. It's a hard climb. It's, a, it's at least a full day, if not longer, climb to a person that's been eating and in good, good health. A person who hasn't been eating, it'd be tough. So we don't really know exactly what Matthew is telling us there. We're tell, he is telling us, though, that the Satan had taken Jesus to a place. Now. Here's a possibility. I'm wondering, based upon some things that are happening in the text, is it likely that these temptations are not just sort of one-time temptations, but they sort of follow Jesus from time to time and harangue him and harass him as he's in the holy city? I don't know how to explain it. Wait, he's in the wilderness and he is in Jerusalem? How does that happen exactly? What, is, did he transport Star Trek? Don't really know. I want to suggest to you that though the, that the translation here suggests that it's possible that Jesus' temptations don't end in the wilderness, that the devil doesn't just leave him to the very end, that there are times and there are places in his life where the Satan comes back to him with some of these same temptations and some of these same uh, problems. And part of that is our own experience because we know we have that kind of our experience itself. So here's, the, here's the, 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 the rub of it, I guess. The tempter says, if you are the son of God, as the voice of heaven declared, then jump. Jump down right now from this pinnacle, this wing of the temple that's sticking out over a ravine. 
And there's a description of that. And, and by the way, if you do that, you don't have to worry because God has promised in the scripture, Psalm 91, that you will have a soft landing. You won't even stub your toe. How likely is that, right? What's, what I think it's important to note is that the devil quotes scripture. We've gotta be aware of that. We've gotta be aware of that. Not just just, uh, not just, not just anybody can quote scripture, of course, correctly. Some quote it incorrectly for their own purposes, their own designs, their own needs. But getting to know the scriptures incomplete will help us, I think, understand when we hear the counterfeit word. So the Satan says to him, God will send an army and catch you. You won't even stub your toe. Jesus, of course, responds. But the passage that he quotes is, is important, Psalm 91. And I'll show you why it's important in just a moment. If, if you read that Psalm, Psalm 91, I hope you will, that Psalm is one about God's protection. If we had time, we'd look at it for a few minutes. But it's about God's protection. God is the protector. God is the refuge. And it does say exactly what the devil claims it says, that he will send an army of angels after you. In fact, that's one of the places we get the idea of the guardian angels, by the way. He shelters his people from enemies. He shelters them from hazards. He shelters them from not only human, but also unhuman, inhuman powers and principalities. He goes on to say that. Here's Josephus on this particular place. I love this quotation because it kind of gives us an idea of what Jesus is up against at this point. This is what he says. The height of the portico standing over it was so very great that if anyone looked down from the rooftop, combining the two elevations, both the temple itself and the ravine, he would become dizzy and his vision would be unable to reach to the end of so measureless a depth. That's how far it was. In other words, you can't even see to the, to the bottom. Your eyes would sort of cloud up. Now, he, he, might need, he might have needed glasses. I think it's possible Josephus might have needed, because I think it's probably possible somebody could have seen down there, but Josephus maybe, need, you know, he had 20, 40 vision or something, wasn't able to see all the way to the bottom of the ravine. We don't know exactly, but it's a long, long, long way up. So the temptation is go ahead, do it. Make a public spectacle of yourself. People will see it. It's a crowded place. There are people there from every nation, probably. People will see what you have done. They will see that you have jumped, that they will see that you landed safely in a miraculous way. Nobody could survive a fall like that, but Jesus did. Instant success. You'd be on all the talk shows. It would be on every newspaper. Everybody would be telling the story about how Jesus fell from this high place and came down with a soft landing. Go ahead and do it, Jesus, and you'll have an instant crowd, you'll have instant success, you'll have instant notoriety. But Jesus refuses. There are to be no shortcuts in this mission because he saw the dove. The dove was his symbol that you are destined for suffering. The dove was his indication that this it's going to be a hard road. It's not a broad way. It's not an easy street that you're on, Jesus. You're on a hard path. That's what the Spirit was saying to him. That's what the dove was saying to him at the time of his baptism. So here's the right stance before God. Again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. God does promise to protect us. God does promise to heal us. God does promise to sustain us. And yet we are not to test that. We're not to say, I'm going to live this way. And God, I want to see how you're going to save me. We're not to put our lives, our families, our fortunes in jeopardy just to see what God is going to do. Don't put God to the test. Jesus didn't put God to the test. Neither should we. Our final temptation, third temptation, a very, very high mountain. 
It's important to notice in Matthew's gospel how many events take place on top of a mountain. A lot of them do. A lot of the most important moments. If you've been to a mountain lately, I'm not talking about the overpass at 288 over the city. Right, I'm not talking about that. If you've been to a mountain lately, we're, we're planning a vacation this summer in Colorado. We normally go to the beach. We're not going to go to the beach this year for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but we're going to go to the mountains this year. We're going to just climb mountains. We're going to be surrounded by God's creation. Most of our lives are spent around stuff like this. Stuff that is man-made. Everything that around you right now, except the person sitting next to you, is man-made. And pretty soon we get the idea that man is the measure of all things because everything that surrounds me is man-made. The wilderness was not a place like that. Jesus was not in a place that would, where there was a lot of man-made stuff. In fact, there was nothing man-made. Happened on a very high mountain. I remember taking some students one time to a very high mountain in North Carolina. Not like Colorado high mountains, but North Carolina. And we had students there who had never seen the Milky Way. It was a clear night. It was a cool night, almost really cold. And when you looked up at the stars, you saw that river of light that streaks across the sky. You can't see it here in Houston. You've got to go to a mountain. You've got to go someplace. Jesus was taken to a very high mountain. There's a lot of things that happened in Jesus' life that took place on a high mountain. If you've been to Israel, you know there's lots of high mountains there. The third temptation, the one we're talking about now, the Sermon on the Mount takes place there, where Jesus, like Moses, delivers God's law to them, writes it on the disciples' heart. Transfiguration takes place on a mountain. There are other places as well. And the book ends, if you remember, the commissioning of the disciples on a high mountain. There are many other places. This, by the way, is the answer to the question of why does Luke, in his gospel, when he tells the temptations, he puts them in a different order. Matthew ends the, the temptation account on a high mountain because Matthew, here's a word that I made up. Is that okay to make up words? Matthew thematizes the mountain. He makes it a theme of his gospel. Why? Because that's where temples were built. Why? Because that's the, the nexus between heaven and earth. Why? Because when you get to the top of a mountain and you look out, you have a sense of the greatness of God's creation. Amen. That you don't get when you're sitting around lights and carpet and, and, and stuff that people made. When you go outside, you kind of get a sense of what God has done and what God is doing. And so Matthew is thematizing the mountain. He has the last temptation take place in his story of Jesus on a high mountain. It's a crucial, crucial temptation. The tempter shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory in an instant, Luke adds, in an instant. What kind of vision is this? What kind of experience? And I can't tell you. I don't know exactly what kind of experience that might have been, that he could see all the cities and kingdoms and the empires of the world in a moment, in an instant, and knew that what the devil was about to say is true. Because he said this, I will give you all of these if you will bow down and worship me. Remember that? He takes the claim seriously. He doesn't say to the devil, now devil, this is not your world. This is my father's world. He doesn't tell him that. He doesn't contest the fact that the devil says, I can give you this because Jesus understands that the world is under the control, not of his father who is in heaven, under the principalities and the powers. But Paul said, the God of this world who has blinded the eyes of the unbelievers so that they can't believe, they don't believe. This world is not yet my father's world. We're here to claim it. We're here to take it back. We're here to proclaim the kingdom. The ministry of Jesus is about entering into the world that's hostile, with hostile forces and hostile powers and reclaiming it. He's about coming in to the, the strong man's house and binding the strong man so that he can steal all of his possessions and claim them back, take them back 
to his Father who is in heaven. So that third temptation, he takes the claim seriously. The devil can do that. And yet, he said, I will not take the easy path. I will not take the path because it stands written that we will worship, we as a people worship Yahweh only, serve Yahweh only, the God of Israel, and all other worship is idolatry. That's how Jesus ends it. And with that, he commands the Satan to be gone. The devil apparently knows what's coming. How much he knows, we don't know, but he, he knows his time is short. He knows it's not gonna, he's not gonna be able to win this battle, but he's gonna fight as hard as he can along the way. When that kingdom comes, and we are to pray as followers of Jesus, your kingdom come. Our daily prayer should be, your kingdom come. Not my will be done, but your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so that's what Jesus is on about here. When the kingdom comes, it'll undo, I love this, undo every bit of evil. Will render untrue every bit of suffering. The suffering that you know, the suffering that I know, the suffering that we all know together will become untrue in that moment when the kingdom comes fully and completely. I want to thank many of you for your prayers for me and my family over last year. Some of you know a little bit about what we've, what we've faced. And it has is, it is resulted in a great deal of sadness and suffering for us. But there's coming a moment in time, I don't know when it is, I, I pray it soon, that everything that we have suffered and everything that we have lost will be gained and rendered untrue. When the kingdom comes completely and totally and fully, that's the point. So the devil says, I'll give you all of this if you worship me. Jesus said no. Worship only the Lord God. Him only should we serve. And then Jesus commands him to leave. He said, get out of here, Satan. Be gone. I kind of wondered why he didn't do that earlier. You know? Be gone. And Jesus realizes that he is attended by angels. In the next moment, when the Satan leaves, the angels of God appear. Now remember what the devil had said to him? That the angels will protect you. In fact, Psalm 91 comes true in that moment. Jesus hasn't leapt from the temple. He hasn't spoken so that the, bread, uh, the stones become bread. He hasn't done any of those things. He hasn't worshiped the Satan. He hasn't bowed down to any that thing that was not God. And he finds himself in the wilderness, surrounded and ministered to and served by angels. Just like Psalm 91 says, Psalm 91 comes true in that very moment. I want to give you a few things, a few thoughts about, uh, let's go to that. Yeah, points for home. Let me just say this. We, we cannot, we must not ignore the reality of the spiritual world. There are forces, there are powers that are out there. And if we ignore them, we ignore them to our own peril. To realize that what we're seeing is not just human beings being rotten or sorry or contemptuous, but very often what we're seeing are principalities and powers at work in things and in people. And the better we understand that, the better we know that, the better equipped we are to sort of deal with those things as they come. If we ignore the reality of the spiritual world, we do it to our own peril. God does test his people. Some of you right now are in the middle of a test. I don't know what it is, you know what it is. It could well be that God is testing you, not because he's trying to say, do you measure up? Are you gonna be good enough for heaven? That's not how it works. He's testing you to show you what's on the inside, to humble you to show you that you do not live by bread alone, the work of your hands alone. You do not live by that. You live by what 
proceeds from the very mouth of God, the blessing of God, the gift of God, when God says, I, I want to bless that person. That's how we live, through the blessings and the benefits and the gifts of God. And also, you know, to train us, to discipline us, whatever your testing is. Maybe you just finished a test. Maybe you're just starting a test. But you realize this is a hard time. And I wonder what God is trying to show me in this. I wonder what I need to know about myself. How am I responding to that? Put that spiritual mirror in front of your face and say, what do I see? How am I acting? What am I saying? That's a key to what's on the inside because when you squeeze a tube of toothpaste, toothpaste comes out. When you're squeezed, what comes out? When somebody rocks your boat, what comes out? That's a test to show you what's inside you. Like Jesus, we can answer and we can find when we are being tested, when we are being tempted, even tempted towards sin. We can find guidance in the scripture. We ought to find guidance in the scripture. The better we know scripture, the better we can handle these things when they come in our lives, regardless of what we're facing. But there's also a caveat to that, and that's this. Like the devil, people can use Scripture for just and unjust purposes. Don't fall for it. Not everybody that quotes Scripture is doing it righteously, justly. Not everybody who invokes God in some way is doing it rightly. We have to be measured. We have to be careful. We have to be wise. And that wisdom comes, as I suggested earlier, from delving into the Scripture and getting deeper and deeper and deeper into the Scripture. That's how it comes. Finally, <laughs> go outside. Spend some time outside. I, I know it's a challenge maybe for somebody, you know, I've got to work and I've got to go, you know, I, I, go from, I go from this heated, cooled space and I go into the car, this heated and cooled, and I go to the office, heated and cooled. Find some time to get outside. It doesn't have to be a wilderness, although you can find God in the wilderness and you can find yourself. I had a friend, and I'll close with this, I had a friend that had a spiritual discipline that once every month, he would take a day and he would go somewhere. He would find a picnic table in a park. He'd go to a state park and he, all he would take would be some water, a sandwich, a Bible, and a journal. And he spent the day like that. Spent seven, eight hours, once a month, getting his bearings out among the trees and the squirrels and the, the creeks and the ravines. He spent one day a month. Now, I don't know that you can do that. I, I do think that it's possible to do some of that. Maybe not for a whole day, but maybe for part of the day. Just to go out and to commune with God and his creation, to see the glory and the beauty of it and to anticipate what God is about to do next with a journal, with a Bible, open Bible, read that and say, what is God trying to say to me now? And make notes, make copious notes of your thoughts and of your prayers. I think going outside is probably a great exercise for all of us. So that we're not surrounded just by man-made stuff. We're surrounded by the stuff that God made. The sky above us, the ground below us, the trees, the critters, all those critters, the birds. It's a beautiful thing. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you for these men and women. Thank you for their lives, for their faithfulness, for the way they've obeyed you and the way they've walked with you. I pray that you will make us aware of spiritual forces around us. Help us to realize that the tests that come our way are meant to reveal ourselves to us. We know we reveal ourselves to others at times, but help us to see ourselves rightly as those who have been forgiven by you, loved by you, helped by you, sustained by you. 
I pray that we will find solace in the scriptures as we are being tested, as we're being tried. And I pray that in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.